Lots of former ECHL personnel are involved in this year's Stanley Cup playoffs. The Kelly Cup playoffs are down to the final four. And we'll talk one-on-one -on -one with the Kelly Cup's namesake. That's all right now on ECHL Week. conference finals are here and the hockey's been great. The four teams remaining in the Kelly Cup playoffs deserve to be where they are. Take the Eastern Conference Championship between the top two teams during the regular season, Reading and Cincinnati. They're two quality clubs and the expectation is that this series will require most if not all the seven possible games. The first game of the series was a great example. It ended up being a back and forth test of wills marathon, a memorable contest. Note that this was the first non-All-Star game in ECHL history to employ two referees. That system will be used in the remainder of this season's playoff games. Here are the highlights. Mark Thompson and Pat Richards describe the action on CBS Sports Radio 1240 AM. Up into the air, it's gloved down by Pecan, and out come the Cincinnati Cyclones with numbers uh, through the neutrals on the offensive end. So a cross ice pass, shot, and score. Royals got caught up ice, and it's a 1-0 lead for Cincinnati as Josh Shalla finished on a little chip across that time by the defenseman Josh McFadden, who started the rush up ice that time for Cincinnati. A nice pass, cross ice at the top of the crease. Redding got caught down deep. It was Bobby Shape. Pat was deep in the left-wing corner. Looked like he got caught, and 6 minutes and 17 seconds into the first period of play, it's a 1-0 lead for Cincinnati. Con comes out with the puck. On the right wing corner, gets rubbed at the last moment by Ian O'Connor, who came down deep to help out defensively. Now Cox will thread it up to T.J. Siner. Siner with possession through the neutral zone, dumps down the left wing side. It's 4:53 remaining in the first period of play. Scores one to nothing, favoring the Cincinnati Cyclones. Puck pops free to the stick of Evan Barlow, top of the right circle, shot by Barlow, score! Evan Barlow, a rocket off the top of the right circle, and Redding's on the board. Set up a four check there, but it's Matthew Aubin up the far wing wall who comes out with it. He gives off to Pellick. He'll chip and chase down right wing side into the Royals defensive zone. Shelgren hot on it. Shelgren has the stick knocked out of his hands. Puck kept alive by Cincinnati. Puck set right out in front, and they score. A little tight backhand by Matthew Aubin went over the goal stick of Riley Gill. On the end wall, it looked like Shelgren lost his stick, allowed the play to continue. The puck came up at the right side of the Royals' crease, and Oban was able to chop the puck off the stick of Riley Gill. Scrum in the Royals' defensive zone. They'll sweep it out up far wing side. It's all uh, jumping it down the wall. Siner in the offensive zone. He's got some help in the form of Cox. Sends it up for Scott! Shot by Siner, went off the D-man, I believe. Josh McFadden and into the net. I think Siner was trying to pass that across to the breaking Ethan Cox. It went off the shin pad of the, the defenseman McFadden and into the goal between the legs of Michael Hauser. And just that quickly on the first shot of the second period, the Royals retie the game at two. Big hit on the end wall. Stepping down low is Ethan Cox trying to set the tempo for the Royals, but back come in transition. The Cincinnati Cyclones into the offensive zone. With it is Pellick. Shot deflected wide. Ends up near wing side. Shot score. Sharp angle. One threaded through. Somehow off deep on the left wing side. Cincinnati buzzing in the offensive zone. Sneak one through. And I think it may have been Pecan who took that shot off the wall that somehow got through the goaltender Riley Gilf. Redding sweep it out, racing through the neutral zone. It's Evan Barlow, one on two into the offensive zone. Cuts to the middle. Barlow with a score! Evan Barlow with his second goal of the game. And Redding has tied the game again. This time at three, seven minutes and 14 seconds into the third period of play. Changed the angle ever so slightly with the toe of the blade and then ripped another laser high into the net. And the Royals once again tie the game at three. Hauser just waved at that as it went over his left arm and in. 
Time of the goal is 7-14 into the third period of play. It does tie the game at three, and we're going to get a tilt here. Gloves are off, and boys are ready to go. Bobby Shea for the Royals, and David McDonald for the Cincinnati Cyclones. McDonald steps in like he's a lefty, now throws a right over the top on Shea. Shea gets some distance, throws a couple of hard rights in on McDonald. McDonald trying to come back with the right hand. Shea steps up. McDonald comes over the top with a right. Shea stepped in now. Bobby Shea trying to get that right hand free. Takes a little bit of an uppercut there from McDonald, who's trying to uh, hog time. Now a left goes over top. The two of them tie each other up. Bobby Shea and David McDonald, uh, the Royals and Cyclones respectively. He'll backhand it down the right wing wall into the Royals' D zone. Back on the retrieve, Dustin Stevenson quickly works it to Brett Fleming. He's up and out into the neutral zone, getting knocked to the ice for the Royals. Now there's going to be a tilt here as Fleming is going to take on Mike Pellick. Pellick has drilled Evan Barlow on the far wing wall. Barlow is slow to get up for the Royals. Fleming wraps up with Pellick here, taking up for the teammate Barlow. The two of them kind of locked on to one another here in the third period. Barlow. It is still slow to get up for the Royals. Brian Grogeski attending to him as Fleming and Pellick are kind of wrestling here. And uh, Pellick was going to get a penalty. The referee LeBlanc did have his arm in the air. Almost a dangerous cough up that time by Cincinnati right out in front of their own net. Playing the puck from behind. Puck behind the Royals net trying to make a move from there. Cincinnati puck knocked away at the last moment. With his shallow back to the point. And the wrister makes it through and scores. Little wrister off the left side, deflected out front. This time stepping in on the deflection was John McFarlane of Cincinnati. And Cincinnati retake for the fourth time in the hockey game. A lead, this one at 4-3. Quickly gloved down by Jean Barrett, defensive blue line. Looking up the left side, has trouble with the puck. And now he'll give it off on the far side. As the Royals try to reset from the defensive zone. Shade to Jean Barrett, hammers offensive zone. It's in the net! A crazy goal! Oh my gosh! A puck ripped him down the left wing side, hit a leg, and ended up going into the net. The goaltender Hauser was going behind the net to play. The game is tied on a power play goal. Wow. That one will go up in the pantheon of Reading Royals hockey history. Don't know who or what it hit on the near wing wall, but it ricocheted directly to the middle of the net on a dump in by Dominic Jalbert. Puck loose on the end wall. Scrum for it. In there, Barlow for the Royals in there as well. Shelgren, Barlow's going to dig it. He's got some space to carry out. Loses an edge. He's on his knees as he gets it to Champagne. Champagne through the neutral zone. As Tifu steals offensive end. Gets a shot. Hits the side of the net. Tifu was deep in the left circle. Trying to throw it on. Oh, as Barlow steals out. Front. Backhand by Barlow. Kicked out by Hauser with the left pad. Barlow on the bid for the hat trick. Tried to go across the body of Hauser. As Buck sent out in front. Shot. Score! Bobby Shea! The Royals win in double overtime, 5-4, and come from behind dramatic fashion and take a one game to none lead on a snapper by Bobby Shea. At the 9.37 mark of the second overtime, it's not the longest game, but may have been one of the most memorable. think that uh, th this is the deepest team we've, se we've seen. Uh, you know, Toledo has uh, had some talented forwards and, and some good goaltending, as did Gwinnett, but I think uh, the strength in Reading is their, uh, is their depth they have overall. It's, it's one line right after another, it's a pairing right after another, so that's a lot of depth over there, and uh, you know, you got to be on your toes, shift in, shift out. Well, I think, uh, to be honest, I thought the Greenville-Florida series were a little more intense. Um, you know, Greenville battled hard. They took some suspensions. They took some bad penalties. I think that cost them in the end. Florida was a different mentality. I think they had a lot of a lot of high-powered offense, and they pushed 60 minutes. And sometimes it's hard to, uh, you know, to, 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 to defend against that because they had so much power offensively. But uh, so far, I think it's going to the series is building to be a, a tough one, and I'm sure every game is going to get more intense. We hear some great stories and ECHL history from the first commissioner of the league. That's next on ECHL Week.
so many reasons to be a fan, so many ways to show it. Customize your own at shop.nhl.com. I'm a legend. I'm the player you want to be. I'm the name you'll wear on your jersey. I'm one of a kind. You'll see me everywhere. On the ice. Online. On the all-star team. Take a good look. I'm the future. Every team to qualify for the National Hockey League Stanley Cup playoffs this season has ECHL alumni on its roster. In all, 52 players and 18 coaches competing for hockey's most cherished prize this spring spent time in hockey's premier AA league. It's the 10th straight season in which at least 25 players with ECHL ties have taken part in the NHL's postseason. As far as coaches are concerned, 12 teams in the playoffs, including all eight in the Eastern Conference, have coaches with ECHL ties. Included in this list are three head coaches, Bruce Boudreau of Anaheim, Jack Capuano of the New York Islanders, and Dan Bilesma of the Pittsburgh Penguins. As of April 30th, there have been 512 players who have played in the NHL after playing in the ECHL. We talk a great deal about the Kelly Cup, which since 1997 has been given to the ECHL playoff champion. But did you know that Patrick J. Kelly was the first commissioner of the ECHL, which from 1988 to 96 experienced the greatest expansion in minor league hockey history, growing from five teams to 21? Kelly was also instrumental in establishing affiliations with teams in the NHL, as well as creating the opportunity for players, on-ice officials, and front office personnel to develop and move up the hockey ladder. Kelly became Commissioner Emeritus of the League in 1996, and since then has presented the league champion with the trophy named in his honor. Earlier this season, I had a chance to sit down with Kelly, and in the first part of our interview, we talked a bit about the league's and Kelly's background. We want to talk a little bit about uh, the history, if we may, for just a few minutes. Describe the hockey landscape, the minor league hockey landscape, back in the late 80s when you and a few others had the idea for this league. Well, I have to give all the credit to Mr. Rabham. He, it was his dream. He had the idea, and uh, I'd coached for Henry about uh, five years before that in the, in the uh, Atlanta Coast Hockey League. And uh, he called me and wanted to know if I'd like to help him start a league. I said, yeah, I'll probably, you know, I'm, I've retired from coaching after 24 years. And I said, I'd love this. So I talked to him and uh, he convinced me that it would be a good thing to go. And I thought it was. And, but I had to convince him first that I didn't want those four-hour games and brawls all night because he had his own arena and he sold his own kegs of beer. And, and I finally convinced him of that. And uh, he owned three of the five teams we started out. And when he offered me a contract to be the commissioner, I said, Henry, I can't, I can't move up here from Charlotte, North Carolina to Virginia for what you offer me. He said, well, I have some other ideas for you too, Pat. I said, well, I hope they're better than the one you just offered me. He said, well, I want you to be my arena manager because he owned his own building. And he had no place to play with, no teams to play with. And I said, I've never been an arena manager. He said, well, you, have you ever been a commissioner? I said, no, so I took the job. <laughs> so my first year, if the, if the Zamboni guy didn't show up on a Friday or Saturday night, I'd be out in the ice doing the Zam and with my shirt and tie on, and the players would sit outside the dressing room and say, hey, there's our commissioner. <laughs> so, but he, is, he's, he was a gentleman. Uh, he, he never wanted nothing for him to help his teams. He owned three of the five, and he just wanted the league to go. And uh, 
He's so I give him all the credit. That was his idea, and his, and I just helped him. He, he, I was glad he hired me to start uh, form in my duties. Did you ever have the opportunity to sell programs to, or are you just strictly a Zamboni driver? I was a Zamboni driver, and if the washrooms uh, over flooded I, and the guys weren't there to help out, I had to go and do it, roll up my suit pants, and the way I'd go. Into the, in the, but we got it going, and, uh, and, and it's it's hard for me to believe, Barry, that's 25 years old. Uh, it's it, it's it, that 25 years has gone so fast; it's unbelievable. Not just 25 years, but starting with five teams and moving now to a point where there are 23 active franchises from coast to coast, from Florida to Alaska, from Southern California to New York State. That must be equally hard to believe, I would think. Definitely. At one time, we had 28 teams back in the, in the, in the early 85s and 90s, uh, or uh, 90s and 95s and that. Uh, and the first three years, uh, my wife did the book work for us, and I was a commissioner. There was only two people in the league and in the office, and my office was like a little, it was right at the rink, and it was a uh, like a press box. If I had a desk and chair, and one side of the desk was my seat, and the other side was my wife's seat. If somebody come to visit us, I had to ask her to go so they could get in. That's how small the office was. So, but it's uh, it's been a thrill to to be part of this thing. Other than the the scope and the, the change in scope and size of the team and, and the years that have passed, obviously the the sports landscape has changed, uh, including the minor league sports landscape. What has surprised you, or what wouldn't you have expected when you helped start the league back 25 years ago? That's happened today. Well, uh, when they named that cup after me, it, that was, I thought my biggest thrill in my life is I wanted to make the National League as a player. I never did. Then I got a chance to coach in the, out here in Colorado with the Rockies. And I thought, man, this this was the greatest feeling I ever had. But the day they named the, the, the retired the Riley Cup and named it the Kelly Cup, that was uh, something I never expected in my lifetime. So, but the other, it, it, there's so many young, but when I would come out of junior hockey to play, there was a lot of teams kids would go and play. There was, there was the Eastern League, the IHL, the Western League, the American League, the Quebec League. But then let's, at, in 88 when we formed the ECHL, it was the American League and the National League. There wasn't very many minor leagues for, play, for kids to play. And uh, so that's why I try to convince uh, Henry Bradman and Bill Coffey that we need to develop a league, not just for players, but for trainers and managers and coaches and officials, all the referees and linesmen. And I think we've done that. And, and right now we have over 15, I think it's 15 referees refereeing in the National Hockey League. I think we've got seven and six or seven co head coaches and assistants coaches. So I always feel a little bit proud in my heart that maybe I was a little bit success in helping them get to their success. Because I had guys that helped me a lot in my career. We saw a little earlier today some trophies on display and uh, the Kelly Cup was right next to the Stanley Cup. That must be, following up on what you just said, that must really choke you up. It chokes me up just thinking about it. Very, you know, I, I remember the, Jack Carnifix was here tonight. He worked in our league office. And, and one time I heard in Trenton had, had won the Kelly Cup. And the Philadelphia Phantoms, I think it was, won the Calder Cup. And the Stanley Cup were all going to be in Trenton. So I called Jack. I said, Jack, you know any photographers up in Trenton area? He said, what for? I said, well, those three cups are going to be there, and I'd love to get a picture of my cup with those other two cups. And so he sent me a picture after they had, it took about a month and a half to get it. And that, I've had it, uh, I had Christmas cards made up of one year of all three, of all the three cups with mine by the Stanley Cup. And so that, and I even sent one to Bruce Bordelow, who I did won a Calder Cup and a Kelly Cup, and he was coaching in with Washington. I said, Brucey, you got the two little ones, now go after the big one. And so it has been the story of my life to, to talk about this uh, picture with the Stanley Cup and the Kelly Cup together. We'll feature more of that interview with Pat Kelly over the next two episodes of ECHL Week. We'll take a look at the start of the Western Conference Final Series when ECHL Week continues.
I think someone at my friend's school has this thing called autism. My friend's brother's son has autism. My neighbor's son has autism. My son has autism. Autism is getting closer to home. Today, one in 88 children is diagnosed with autism. That's a 1,000% increase in the last 40 years. Learn more at autismspeaks.org slash signs. From opening night until the Kelly Cup is raised, watch every game of the 2012-13 ECHL season exclusively on AmericaOneSports.com. Catch the action live or on demand. Games available on your PC, Mac, or mobile device. The biggest goals, hardest hits, and spectacular saves all season long can be found only at AmericaOneSports.com, the official broadband broadcaster to the ECHL. For the 20th consecutive season, over 3 million fans attended ECHL games in 2012-13. The 23 ECHL clubs welcomed nearly 3.9 million folks through the turnstiles this season, an average of almost 4,700 per game. It's the ninth straight season and the 21st time in the last 23 seasons that the per game average has exceeded 4,000 fans. It's also the highest per game average in 13 years. Overall attendance was up 9.7% from last season. Fort Wayne led the ECHL with an average of 7,583 fans per game in their first season in the league. The Comets had 10 crowds of at least 8,000 fans this season, including three games in excess of 10,000. In all, 12 of the league's 23 teams experienced increases in attendance over the 2011-12 season. After completing what would have to be considered at least minor upsets in the conference semifinals, the Western final between fourth-seeded Stockton and third-seeded Idaho still figures to be a tough series between two talented clubs. The Thunder are bidding for their first trip to the Kelly Cup finals, this after taking out regular season champ Alaska in the conference semis. The Steelheads last made the finals in 2010, and their last Kelly Cup title was in 2007. The winner of this series plays for the Kelly Cup. For Game 1, Will Henneke has the call for us on KTIK. Puck turned over behind the net, quick shot! Wah well, makes the save, can't find the rebound for a moment, and then he's able to glove it down. So the Steelheads, a very opportunity here again, created by the hustle of that number three line, De Castroza, Robinson, and Taylor. Wah well, makes the save, Idaho will get an offensive zone draw. 20 seconds to go in the man advantage. The Stockton Thunder on it here early in the game. Cross ice pass intercepted by Justin Taylor. Settles it down, flips it in the air. DeCastroza comes in, away, and Awa makes the save. Good job there by David DeCastroza. Coming off of an excellent game number six in Ontario. Got a shot off, but Wa able to corral it with the glove. Robinson cut off, but he got enough of it to get it out. Hustling off the ice will be Andres. Hustling on De Castroza as the steel has on the penalty kill for another 45 seconds here. Cross ice pass picked off. Short handed breakaway. Brett Robinson shoots and it rolls just wide. De Castroza the rebound has it. Plays it back into the right hand corner. Touches it behind the net. And coming over to the near side it's Weller. So Robinson the short handed breakaway. But and if nothing else it kills some time. Good play by Robinson. Hands it off to Ryder, who will start up the far side of the ice. Into the middle, it's Taylor, directs it down to the right wing corner. He'll stay after it along with Gibb. Taylor wins the race to the puck, trying to get it out front to Robinson. Was a little bit too far, and the Thunder will look to counter here. Berglund will just chip it up high in the air. Hunt gloves it down. Labrie right with him. Good work by Labrie. Plays it behind the net. Intercepted. Loose puck. Backhand shot and a score. Heck of a shot from Andrew Clark. A backhand shot inside the far post through a bit of a screen. The Thunder take a 1-0 lead. Back to pick up the puck for the Thunder. 
rimming it around. DeCostroza hustling to keep it alive for Idaho. Justin Taylor coming after it. Puck held by Brett Robinson to DeCostroza, who scores for the Steelheads. 14 seconds into the third. And the crowd is on their feet as once again the Thunder have trouble with the puck behind their own net. A hustling Justin Taylor and Brett Robinson get it to DeCostroza near the top of the crease. This time he beats Waugh cleanly and we're square at one goal apiece. See if it holds in for Mike Little. Loose it to Andrew Carroll. Carroll gets tied up. Not enough for an interference, though, as the Thunder retreat in their own end to pick up the loose puck. Robinson assist. Puck is in. Did it go in? They're going to say it did. Oh, the Steelheads don't like this one at all. I didn't see the goal light ever come on. Let's take a look here. The Thunder are celebrating an apparent goal. Did not see the goal light come on. Let's take a look here. Let's take a look. Did it cross the goal line? Referee Joe Sullivan is coming over to speak directly with the goal judge behind the play. Sullivan was not emphatic with his call. The puck dropped down. It looked right on the goal line. From the only replay we can see, you lose sight of the puck momentarily. Behind it looks like Jace Coyle's leg. So there's really, you can't see from that angle, and that's really the only one we have. Does the puck ever cross the goal line? The Thunder think it did. You can't, you can't tell. You can't tell at all. And Joe Sullivan went and spoke to the goal judge again. The goal light never came on. And Sullivan was less than emphatic with his goal call. So let's see here. They're taking a lot of time. A big moment here. The Thunder at the one-minute mark of the third think they've taken the lead. Steelhead's not so sure. Let's see what they go with. The crowd chanting no goal here. Can't see on the replay. You just can't tell. As the puck came right down on the goal line, disappears momentarily by Jace Coyle's goal. They wave it off. And a big, big, big break for the Idaho Steelers. I cannot say definitively that that puck did not go in. Cannot say definitively it did not go in. You just lose sight of it just long enough behind Coyle's leg, but there's no way to know for sure. It's going to try and catch the Thunder in a line change ahead to Andrew Carroll. Right hand wing. Thunder, good hustle to get on the on the ice there after that change. Loose puck with it. Stockton with it. It's Bhutan with 6.50 to go in the third. Long pass out to neutral. Into the offensive zone comes Stockton. Low angle shot. Save. Rebound. Score. Maxime Boisclair knocked that one out of midair. Thunder take a 2-1 to one lead. The Steelheads asking for a high stick. Don't think they're going to get it, and I think it's a good call by the referee. Back to case it comes. Finds a little lane, has Baldwin. Baldwin creeps in, takes a shot, redirected, and it rolls just wide. Oh, good opportunity by Robinson, but he just, just missed. Coming in, it's Andrew Clark looking back door. Baldwin takes it away. The Thunder score. Good play by Ryan Hayes there, and that, my friends, won't quite do it, but you want to talk about a dagger. The Steelheads inches, inches away from tying it. And then give Clark credit coming the other way. Battling through some contact. Baldwin, a great look to Robinson, and he deflects it just inches wide of the net. And then the Thunder come back the other way. Clark fights through some contact. I beg your pardon, it was, uh, it was Hayes fighting through some contact with Baldwin. And able to just keep it alive and snap it under the glove of Idaho goaltender Josh Robinson. 3-1 Thunder. And write this one up to Olivier Waugh. Stealing Thunder probably should not have won. But they did. And if Olivier Waugh is not your top star, I might beat someone up. He was sensational tonight. On our next show, we'll know which two teams will be playing for the Kelly Cup. And we'll continue our conversation with Pat Kelly. 
make sure to join us. Until then, make it a good week, make it an ECHL week.